neighbouring county such as Leicestershire, can you receive treatment at Birmingham Women's Hospital for pregnancy as a lupus sufferer? Um, yes, certainly we provide pre-pregnancy counselling to people from a wide number of places. Um, we do provide pregnancy care for women who think they can get to and from the hospital um, in a reasonable time frame. I think it does depend a little bit where in Leicestershire you might live. Um, but certainly if you are thinking of planning pregnancy and you want advice about how that pregnancy should be planned, probably the thing to do is ask your GP to refer you to the clinic that's run by my colleague Dr. Tracy Johnston at Birmingham Women. She's the obstetrician in charge. Um, and um, it's called the Immunology Antenatal Clinic for historical reasons. Um, and if it has her name on it, whether or not it's got my name on as well, if you've got lupus, you will have the right clinic. And then when you come to that visit for pre-pregnancy counselling, we can discuss where it would be most practical for you to have pregnancy care when you become pregnant. And it would depend a lot on geographical issues as well as health issues. Um, if you were already pregnant, um, you can still get advice from our clinic about how your pregnancy might be managed. But it would again be a big issue to decide whether or not to transfer care in the middle of pregnancy. We can never get determine for certain how someone else will manage your pregnancy, but we can certainly provide advice. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the next question, uh, which is, is lupus hereditary? Which I think is quite a complicated question to answer. So when, as doctors, when we talk about hereditary illnesses, we tend to think about illnesses that are caused by a single gene that is going wrong. And that makes it fairly predictable, giving you an estimate of how, what the risk is of passing this on to your children or to having it if your parents have it. So something like haemophilia, for example, we can say, well, you know, if, you've, if you've got a son, there's a 50% chance he's going to get it. So, so we know with lupus that if you, look, um, if you look at the population as a whole, people with lupus do have slightly more relatives who also have lupus or other autoimmune conditions. So to some extent the answer is yes, but, but, but the answer is that even though the risk is slightly higher, it's still a very small risk. So for example, if you're, let, let, let's say your risk of getting lupus is so sort of more than the European person is say one in 20,000, well we can say that your, your children have a slightly higher risk of getting it, it may be one in 5,000, but that's still 4,999 chances that they're not going to get it and one that they are. So the, the answer is that there's, statistically speaking, there is a slight hereditary component, but it's not in any way high enough to worry. Unless both parents already have the disease. 
question is how, how long after taking the toxin out should you wait before conceiving? I think the convention was saying six months. I'm not sure. That's the new world one. Traditional article is 12 months, but there's absolutely no reason to wait longer than six months because the antibody that can protect the antibody is itself going to be so that the body can't cross into the baby circulation until four months of pregnancy. So that means maybe 10 months after you've had the treatment, how much time is virtually not left in the mother's blood. Um, okay. So how, how is it best to approach a rheumatologist for first time to ensure a speed of diagnosis rather than having precious time responded, please? So this is basically how to use the GP to infer Is there a difference between antiphospholipid antibody and lupus anticoagulant antibody? If so, what is it? Are the treatments the same or different? <coughs> Depending what hospital you go to, there are several different tests available for antiphospholipid antibodies. And yes, there are, there are several different tests. Um, lupus anticoagulant is <coughs> one test and is the one that probably predicts blood clots the best and problems in pregnancy. Best. But there are some other tests done called anticardiolipin antibody and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody and there are actually several versions of the anticardiolipin antibody. Some hospitals do IgG and IgM separately, some even do something called IgA and they're basically all variations on the theme of the antibody. Um, certainly each of those tests is different and the more that come back positive the bigger the risk of getting problems with blood clots out of pregnancy, in pregnancy, and pregnancy complications from the antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, but the way that the disease would be treated would depend on which clinical features you have, whether they were in pregnancy or out of pregnancy, and um, which tests were abnormal might influence it. The most important thing is that the abnormal test is shown to be present on at least two, two occasions, 12 weeks apart, because occasionally the blood tests are abnormal after an infection and it all goes away after the infection's gone, and therefore the risk of blood clotting's gone away after the infection's gone. In fact, there isn't much risk of blood clotting during a short-lived infection. But some of the antibodies only come and go very briefly, um, and that's not a risk. If they come and they stay, that is a risk. Um, but you would never be treated unless you've actually had a clinical event. So I've, I've, I've saved what I think is probably the trickiest question to last, but, but one that we get asked a lot and, and, I, and I know is a, a sort of great source of frustration to patients with lupus. So the question is why do I feel so bad when my blood's come back fine? Um, and I think that that is a, to some extent, 
the million dollar question um, and probably fortunately reflects our, our, our lack of knowledge, our lack of scientific understanding as to exactly what uh, causes symptoms like fatigue, muscle pains without any, any clear inflammation. I, I suspect that there are probably a whole number of different factors that contribute and may not be the same in every person. So, so I think on a sort of scientific level or on an immunological level, we know that there are things going on with the immune system in lupus that seem to be rather similar to the things that go on in people who have some sorts of viral infections. And so some of the sensation of aching and fatigue may represent activation of that bit of the immune system we don't really have a routine test for measuring that in, in the clinic. There are ways of measuring it in, in a science lab, but they haven't come through to the NHS. So that may contribute to some extent. I think there are lifestyle factors that also probably contribute that, that, that Sarah touched on in her talk and the way that lupus affects your ability to, to, to exercise and, and normal interactions with people and can disturb your sleep. Um, I think the honest answer is that, 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 we, that we're not quite we're not quite sure. I think one important quote which Sarah touched on, but perhaps I can just phrase it slightly differently, is people often get physically deconditioned. Mm -hmm. So they've had very bad lupus, they've been very ill, they've been very inactive because they did have the joint swelling or you know, serious disease affecting their heart or their lungs or their brain or whatever. They've had all the treatments, they've actually got better, the blood tests have got better, and they still feel exhausted and get tired very easily. And it's because they haven't taken any exercise or done the ordinary everyday things like walking around going shopping that suddenly everyday things feel really bad and I get a lot of people refer to me with this very problem and sometimes the, the letter is phrased by the GP or the consultant and another hospital you know what do I do next they're on all these drugs or they've had these drugs and they don't feel better they're frustrated and I don't know what to do and the answer is that actually the problem isn't now the lupus the problem is the after effects and they do need the sort of help Sarah said they need to basically to get retrained into doing everyday things and build up their stamina. And I say the example is like an athlete who's had an injury and they have to go back and learn to walk and then run 100 yards and then 400 yards and then eventually they'll go back to running a marathon. Everyday activities become a marathon for somebody who's been very ill. But people don't recognise it. It's like you said, there's no rash. Nobody can see what's wrong. But they've actually forgotten how to do everyday things. Their body's forgotten and it's a very slow and very frustrating process building strength and stamina back up. But more often than that's what it needs, and it needs the support of people like Sarah and Rebecca who works with me to help patients just have the patients do it <coughs> themselves uh, with the help of physios, counsellors, sometimes eventually going to a gym. But to begin with, going to a gym is a lost cause because it's much too intense. And you just have to start, as you said, walking short distances, five minutes a day. 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, you might increase once a week, you might only increase once a month, but over a matter of months, it gets better. And you really can improve. A lot of people don't realise how long it can take. But if you think back to how long it took you to get ill, it's not surprising it takes a long time to get better. Can I ask what do you use on brain fog? You know, a lot of us are, we forget we forget words, next you know the table, but the table won't come. Or you could play the, uh, you're talking to someone and um, I was doing this week with, um, who was it last night? With someone last night, completely forgot what I was talking about, you know, I think today, actually. Saying something, you think, well, I know I've got something to say, but it's gone. Or, or losing time, you know, talking together. It's, uh, I know it's, it's a big issue with, with a lot of people with me. I know that with the patients with vascular loss that I also work with, uh, there's quite a lot of research being done about that, and they're actually looking to what's called autonomic neuropathy now. And some people have actually done some uh, little research with scanners and things, and actually seeing there are some changes within the brain. So it's very early days, but there is a lot of work actually going on about that. So it's a very real and a very troubling <coughs> symptom for you, but we're just not quite ahead of the game. Yeah.
and I think, yeah, I think like really practical things if you are having problems with getting things, you know, using things like electronic devices like phones and things, setting alarms on your phone to manage to take the tablets or going to wake you up and collect the children from school or whatever, you know, writing things down. And that sounds really, really laborious. But sometimes if you do put those little practical measures in, which then means that you succeed in doing the things you want to do, then that in turn helps them to just do better. I think it can be a mixture of disease and just being overtired or not sleeping well. If you anyone who doesn't sleep well has more problems like that. Um, when you're depressed or low in mood, it's very common. But there are definitely some people where it's part of their disease. And there are times where it, it, the underlying cause may vary. The worst thing is if it's all the time and getting steadily worse. And then it definitely needs investigating. If it comes and goes, then it's most worrying. And even if there are some abnormalities, as you say, with some parts of the nervous system or the blood flow in the brain, as long as it's intermittent, um, there's no hope that juggling everything else will make it better. But if it's steadily getting worse, and sometimes it does need investigating and treating, it's certainly been, I think, looked for in lupus for a long time. But I think it varies a lot between the patients, which is why the research is inconclusive. Because I don't believe that this in, in, it's probably true in many parts of lupus, but that in particular is where there may not be just one explanation. Hello. <laughs> How do I know which organs are being affected and awaiting a diagnosis? Um, or how does that get investigated? So, I, I, mean, I think essentially through the combination of your description of what you're feeling and what the doctor finds on examining you and the, the sort of blood blood tests and urine tests that you have done. So, some things obviously as a, as a patient you come to us and it's, you, you can tell us there's a problem like your, like, like your skin uh, and, and others like the kidneys I talked about really you, you can't tell at all until you have the, uh, have the investigations uh, done. But it's, it's really just a, just, just a case of a, a good medical consultation where someone listens to what you're saying and examines you properly and, and does the relevant tests really. Extra blood tests or x-rays would be ordered depending on what was found talking to you and examining you and on very basic testing. You mentioned having early blood tests. Which ones can I, I be proactive and ask for them? I think they're all in the Lucas UK booklets mm -hmm. and it would take quite a while to go over all of them okay. here. But I think we have written on them in one of the booklets. So you take a copy of that and what we'll get one sent to you. Thanks. Just on the spur of the moment, when you talked about exercise, um, there was somebody mentioned that somebody went to me and they found it very beneficial. I'm not the lupus sufferer, but my wife is. Um, as part of our exercise, we go swimming, but my wife was told by the consultant that with the risk of infections, it wasn't such a good thing. Obviously, we hope that for her to go swimming would be a good thing, but she's not been going simply because of that advice. So there's some is it contradiction or, or is there evidence, whichever way? I think it would just be if you are on a lot of immunosuppression on very high dose steroids and maybe have a treatment like cyclophosphamide in those early sort of weeks, then we might say don't go, but in general terms, we would want you to try and be as fit and healthy and active as you possibly can be. Could I ask from how wide an area would you be? prepared to see patients or alternatively will the three of you move to Devon and Cornwall? <laughs>
mm. and have done for a while because I've trained with people in Bristol who, uh, before I went to Birmingham, who are in the West Country and they've been referring to me for quite a while. So I do see quite a lot already from that part of the world. I see them from Wales, I see them from Lincoln, I see them from Sheffield. Um, I don't think I see that many further north because they usually appropriately go to Manchester. I think we'd both, both be happy to take referrals from anywhere that I think. I think just as a sort of practical consideration, I think that if you <coughs> feel you, very sick with your lupus, if you have arthritis, for example, we generally like to see patients a lot every two weeks to start off with, every month after that. And I think there's some practicalities of thinking I've got a three hour drive to get somewhere every two weeks, also, also just needs to be. If you become very unwell and all of your care is provided somewhere else and you suddenly turn up as an emergency in your local hospital and they know nothing about you at all. It's, 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 it's I usually work with as well. other rheumatologists or nephrologists or whatever specialty it is appropriate to be in it and it can be any specialty in the area. And I think many of us um, who do see people to give extra advice do like to liaise with local people and primarily try and keep the care close to home. Um, there are some patients who choose to make that journey regularly, particularly if they have family that can stay with them. Um, but I think they, as Ben says, there's always the risk you'll get sick and then they've got no records. We are increasingly making sure patients can carry their own records and uh, sort of having online systems for them to be able to access their records from anywhere and share their records with any that improves, it will make some of these issues more practical. But there'll always be the practical issue if you're very sick, you're going to go to your local hospital. Even in Birmingham, if you live near the Queen Elizabeth Hospital but you want to come to City, they won't take you in an ambulance if you're sick, and vice versa. They have to take you, the ambulance service has to take you to the closest hospital if you're sick. And therefore it's good if the local hospital knows something about you, if only to know who to liaise with about your own. Um, I just wanted to know whereabouts are we with the research? I mean, how many research centres are there um, for lupus or people? Um, are we researching the triggers of lupus um, and are we researching the cure for lupus? Many of the 
present his report as Ben said in many different types of research. Um, but it's a big landmark in this research in the UK that they finally put the on medical research and cancer to give us a really big grant to be something substantial over the next four years. Can I just give another push for that? This is the first occasion which is called Master Funds, um, this project. And it's the very first time that patients have been, are being brought in at the beginning of something. You know, you might get halfway through a research program and say, oh, we'll get the patients into this. But patients are being involved right from the very beginning. And they've already been about five different meetings in different parts of the country. We had one here in this building uh, in, in October when we discussed how we were going to work it with Birmingham. Uh, so I know there are a few, few people in the room here. I know we've already signed up to it. But if you would like to be kept in touch with this project and to be involved, you wouldn't necessarily have to come to a meeting like that to do something by email or, or a telephone call. We, we're not sure yet exactly what we can do, but we know there are going to be things to do. And it would be good if we've got a bank of people we can call on, you know, and say, this is happening, can we be involved with this? Uh, so if you are interested in that, if you'd like to drop me uh, an email or, or a note, and we can put your name on file and keep you informed of anything that's happening. I and mean, we probably will have a meeting. Yeah, at the moment there's an awful lot of bureaucracy to do the setting up how this money is going to be spent and distributed among all the collaborating partners. And there's about five million pounds coming from the pharmaceutical industry, there's pharmaceutical companies and some people involved in laboratory diagnostic tests involved. Um, and it's a logistic nightmare, I'm told, to sort out all the contracting business, uh, the money, who gets what and how it goes where, um, before we can even start. Um, but as things become clearer, and as it's clear of what we will be involved with um, in this area and what our patients can contribute to, both in terms of what we're doing locally, but also contributing and reviewing things like patient information sheets for new components of the research studies. And many of you might have taken part in research and wondered why the things that are wrong are sort of long-winded and couldn't be improved the way that information is discussed with patients wanting to take part in studies. Well, there's an admirable role for patients to be involved with, but there are many others including helping to influence which areas get priority for research in the project. Um, so as Yvonne said, anyone who sounds like they might be interested in this, let her know. Certainly we'll be organising another meeting in the coming months, but at the moment it's too, too soon to really be able to say a lot more than we said last time. We don't want to bring people to a meeting unless we've got some very specific topics to discuss that we're ready to implement. I should say actually that James <coughs> much, um, our chair is, uh, is very involved as a collaborator with the with medics with Master Plan. She, she's on that level and I'm on that one with patients. But, uh, but um, Joan is very involved with yes, And she, even though she's stepping down as chair of the leadership plan, she, she's going to continue um, to be involved with Master Plans. Uh, and I think also you can be pleased to know that yesterday, during the Lucas UK Trustee meeting, we were informed of four more research projects. Um, at various um, hospitals, and so we are, the machine code is actually funding a lot of research uh, as well as that of his nurses. So be assured that every penny you raise is being put to good use. Okay. Have we got any more questions? Everybody happy with, uh, with what they've heard? <laughs> um, um, you spoke a lot about medication. I just wondered, is it possible that the disease could become so inactive that a person could come completely off the medication? Uh, yes, I think it's, it, it, I think it's, it, it's the answer to that. I mean, it is a very variable condition, so some people have very active disease that lasts for a relatively short period of time, like a year or even less. Other people do have a grumbling, more persistent disease. We've certainly got a considerable number of patients who, over time, manage to stop and withdraw from their medication and appear not to have further flare-ups, particularly very, very rarely see active disease in, in patients who are 
like elderly, and that's a long time to wait for, for a lot of patients, but you know, certainly at some stage later in life, it's very common for lupus to appear, to go into remission and, and, and disappear. So, so I think the answer is yes. But you always have to be mindful that it may come back. And certainly dental people should stop attending in hospital for checkups and for blood tests. Um, particularly with kidney disease, the most dangerous time for a flare-up is after you come off medication. <coughs>